Everybody, I'm privileged to have the amazing opportunity to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Mike Clarensaw, and uh, he is a personal friend, his wife, Carrie, and he have known Lacey and I for a long time. We won't tell you how many years. This has been a long time, everybody, and uh, he is awesome, and I wish I had the time to tell you not only what he, the Lord has done through his life, but how he personally has encouraged and mentored Lacey and I over the years and, uh, and I wish I had time to tell you all that, but I don't. But I'll just say this. He has pastored for quite some time, everybody. So uh, uh, Dr. Mike it was in Wamigo pastoring and then Wichita for 10 years. And then he was in a national office setting uh, in a, a network called Healthy Church where they were just helping churches, not only trying to grow, but try to be healthy as possible. And uh, has helped so many people. He's a dean of college at a, a school in Texas called Southwest Assembly of God University. And now he's a church consultant, and, uh, and he's traveling all over the place and speaking, just trying to help churches continue to be healthy and grow uh, in their love for the Lord and, and in their unity together. So uh, we are, I'm telling you, we're privileged and honored to have him with us today. And, uh, and so personally, let me just say, Lacey and I, when we were in Springfield, Missouri, and I was campus pastoring, I had the privilege while he was in the national office setting that he attended our campus. Now, there's a little bit of pressure there, when, especially when I got to preach and knowing that he was out there watching. And, uh, and, uh, but just so encouraging to us, especially when we went through some hard times and uh, they loved us uh, so well. And so let's return the favor, everybody, and let's love on him. Would you give it up for my friend, Dr. Mike Clarence Hall? Come on, Rock Hills. Uh, good morning. Wow, this is so cool. I, I remember when this was a dream in your heart that God would do this. And here we are. You said eight and a half years later, really? Man, you guys are old. That's, a, that's crazy. Wow. No, it is, it is such a joy to, to get to be here today and to get to share with you for a little bit from God's Word. Uh, just to be in town again, I, I did uh, back in the last millennium. I pastored down the road at uh, Wamigo. It was a long time ago, uh, but uh, uh, great to be back in this area and uh, love Kansas. Uh, just This is our home area. We live in Washington right now, and uh, that's a weird part of the world, but it's just really great. Uh, <laughs> Really great to be here with these guys whom I love so much. We have known each other a long time. I've known Lacey since before she, there was a Lacey. Uh, <laughs> her mom and dad have been, her dad's been my best friend for almost 40 years now. And so uh, very cool to get to be here and to see what God is doing in this place. Do you love Jesus this morning? I want to jump right into the text and continuing your series here. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 3 this morning, and um, what we're going to look at is the text that where Paul is really pulling together what he's been doing in the first two chapters. He, he pulls it all together to create the foundation for the argument for the gospel he's about to present to the Romans. So this is a very essential part of... Uh, Maybe he feels a little, at first glance, like a somewhat complicated part of this particular letter. But let's just read together, beginning in verse 1. I want to read you the whole text, and then we're going to get into uh, what is said here. It says in, in verse 1, it says, What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Now, if you're just here today and you haven't been in the previous part, that might hit you like cold water. You know, what are we talking about? But hang, hang with us just a little bit, okay? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Lots of questions here. Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. That's talking about God. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument, Paul says. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory or makes him look better... Why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim we say, this is Paul, let's do evil that good can result? Well, their condemnation is just. So what shall we conclude? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already 
made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, and here's the heavy part, there's none, no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Don't you just want to say hallelujah? I mean, that's a, <laughs> wow. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. How many need some good news now after all that? But now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. How many understood that whole text? We can just go right now if you're done. I know. This is, this is a, there's some challenging thoughts here and want to jump into them. Uh, here in just a moment. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but back in the day, uh, your pastor was a basketball player. And from what I understand, a, a pretty good one. How many, you kind of sense that just by looking at him? He just has that, <laughs> kind of has that look about him. You know, that's not really a surprise. I mean, he's tall, he's athletic looking, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's kind of the picture of that. What might surprise you to learn is that I was a basketball player too. Thank you for those giggles. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I was, but I wasn't a very good one. No surprise there. Actually, I think the best way to say it is I was a bit of a late bloomer, much to the frustration of my coach at my small Christian school. But I tried really hard, practiced a lot in the driveway, used to hang on the swing set in the backyard trying to get taller. <laughs> Didn't work. In the summer after my sophomore year, of high school, I attended a basketball camp along with other players from my school and from other Christian schools in the city. I was the smallest player in attendance at this camp. I was still waiting for the growth spurt that would one day produce this. <laughs> and that growth spurt didn't come till after my junior year when I proceeded then to grow nine inches to arrive at this. So you're getting the picture. Anyway, on the, last, on the last day of this week-long basketball camp, after five days had made it very clear that I was the least talented player at the camp, the coaches announced a culminating two-on-two -two tournament. This is how the event would end, that they would divide us into teams two-on-two, -two, and they paired us up. Now, one of the cool things about this camp was a player who had come to the camp visiting with his cousin. His cousin we knew. His cousin was the star player for one of the other uh, Christian schools there in the city, he, one of our rival schools, and we knew him. But the visiting cousin was even better. The visiting cousin, I'd seen his picture on the front page of the sports page in the Kansas City Star. The visiting cousin had been all city. He'd been an all state first teamer. He had just led his, his powerhouse high school. Back in the day, Wyandotte High School was a dominant basketball program in the state of Kansas. I don't know if that's continued. But he had just led them to the state title. In fact, this, this guy's name, if you, go, if you go back a ways, his name is Larry Drew. Now, now Larry went on from there. He, he started four years at the University of Missouri. He was drafted into the NBA where, where he played uh, a, a number of years, I think it was 10 years in the NBA, scored over 8,000 points in his NBA career, and even ended up being head coach for three different NBA franchises after his playing days were over. Larry was at this camp. And while I was the worst player at the camp, Larry was far and away the best player at this camp. Six foot two, run like a gazelle, jump out of the gym. I mean, he was, he was this phenomenal athlete. So when they paired us up, guess what? Larry was my teammate. 
He was the best. I was on the other end of that spectrum. And we won that tournament quite easily, I should say. We even got trophies for this particular thing. Now, it, it may not surprise you to learn that the primary reason we won was Larry. I deserve a little credit for passing him the ball every time I got it. In fact, in our first game, we were playing against my best friend and his brother. They were the two best players on, from my school. And my best friend was guarding me, and he had the ability to take the ball from me just about any time that he would choose to. But, it, but instead, David looks at me as I'm dribbling the ball, and he says, if I were you, I'd pass the ball to Larry. <laughs> now, that wasn't trash talk. That was friendly advice. So I did, and I figured the sooner I did that every time, the sooner we would score and the sooner we would win. You see, once I was ready to admit that only Larry could win me that trophy, well, he did. And for some reason, that silly story jumped into my thoughts the first time I read this text preparing for today. Maybe you'll understand why here in just a little bit. In the first four four verses of this passage, we first thing we see is a challenge for an apostle. At first glance, it almost feels like we find ourselves in the middle of an argument in this passage as Paul is presenting these questions. In truth, what we're, what we're experiencing here are, is typical of the challenges that the apostle Paul faced as he traveled city to city and as he sought to spread the gospel and establish the church. You see, as he would do that, he would face opposition, typically from the Jews of the city. As an evangelist and church planner, he had a very consistent strategy. I don't know if you've talked about this already, but it's going to become more important the deeper we go into the book of Romans. Because the first thing he would do when he came into a new city is he would go to a synagogue because that's where the Jews would gather. These are his people. These are folks that have been raised in the same mindset and the same understandings that, that he has known. And so he would go there and he would tell them about Jesus, about Jesus' sacrifice, about Jesus' resurrection, about how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies concerning the Messiah. And he would explain to them or try to explain to them the grace that God had now extended to all who believe. And while some of them, a few of them would listen and believe, many of them would oppose him and arguments would, would follow. And so when that resistance would reach a certain peak, Paul would say, okay, all right, all right. And he would kind of shake out his robe, which was symbolic of, you know, kind of saying, okay, my responsibilities here are done. And he would leave that spot and he would go out and find Gentiles and he would share the gospel with them and they tended to be a more receptive audience. Well, in Romans chapter 3, what Paul's doing here is replaying some of the arguments he runs into among Jews everywhere he goes. That, that's what these questions are. He's raising the questions that he is frequently asked. And you don't have to really be a Jewish scholar to understand this first one. Because fundamental to Paul's message, the foundation he's trying to lay, is that every individual needs God's grace. Turn to the person next to you and say, yeah, you too. Every individual needs God's grace. If they, don't, if they look like they didn't believe you, say it again. <laughs> no one can earn the righteousness or the right standing with God on their own. But all of us need his grace. Paul's going to walk us through that here in just a minute. But the idea that Jews and Gentiles are equally in need, that they're on the same footing here, both needing grace, well, that was something that the Jews simply were unwilling to accept. After all, they were God's chosen people. They were, in their minds, God's special possession. Actually, I think a little bit in their minds, God was their special possession. He belongs to us. For the Jews of Paul's day, this, this is a huge stumbling block. This, I mean, it's difficult enough for them to imagine the idea of letting Gentiles in to what God is doing, but to suggest that their need of God's grace was equal, that, that's, that's just a non-starter for them. So Paul's heard all this before. Verse 1, what advantage then would there be in being a Jew? That, that's where he starts. What value is there in the symbol of that, of that relationship in circumcision? Are you saying being God's chosen people doesn't mean anything? 
See, that, that's where he's starting here. I mean, if Jews and Gentiles are equally in need of God's grace, then what's the point of the law? What's the point even of the lives we've been living? Is being a Jew and following God's ways all these years of no value whatsoever? Now, we might expect Paul to say, given his argument, yeah, afraid so. That's right. Yeah. Because being a Jew doesn't give them special standing in their need of God. But instead, he surprises them by saying, no, it really does matter being a Jew. It's of great value. Much in every way, verse 2 said, much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. We Jews, he's saying, we're blessed to be God's people, to know him, to know his ways, to know his words. That we need grace too doesn't mean our knowledge of God has no value. Now, let's not get lost in their argument. Because how many didn't get up this morning wondering if Jews and Gentiles were on the same footing with God? How, I, I don't think that's our issue so much today, is it? We're not debating that particular issue in our thoughts. Instead, for us, maybe the argument goes something like this. Any church kids in the room? You grew up in church? You spent most all of your life? I'm one of you. I've, I've spent all 62 years of my life uh, in church. I was born on a Friday and I was in church on Sunday. <laughs> Mainly went because the pastor visited me in the hospital. I thought I'd go after that. Jesus saved me from a life of chasing wild women in the church nursery when I was three. That's... <laughs> You know, I, I am a church kid, and, and so like some of you who also have that same experience, I, I've been taught the Bible and the ways of Jesus my entire life. I mean, that's just normal. I, I've generally tried to live the way that Jesus has commanded. That's, that's been the story of my journey. It might be different from you. Even when my friends were off doing things that Jesus had kind of conveyed weren't a good idea for me, I was trying my best to live according to what I knew the Bible was teaching. But in my 20s, I met this guy. His name was Lee. And Lee didn't grow up like me at all. He did all sorts of things that I had never done. And he had all sorts of ideas that I had never thought. Until someone like the Apostle Paul introduced Lee to Jesus. And everything suddenly changed for Lee. And I was glad for him. I mean, I really was. I mean... He, he had what we back in the day used to call a great testimony. You know, we would applaud when he would share his uh, moral rags to riches story, you know, how, how God had turned his life around and fixed him. Maybe some of you have a story like that of what Jesus has done to transform your life. And I, and I was happy for him. I, I really was. I mean, that, that was great. Um, but I, I could be tempted to ask, well, if... Lee didn't do all that good stuff or make all that effort when he was a kid, and he ends up with God's grace. In fact, he went on to be a, a very prominent, a well-known youth evangelist. He was a youth pastor, has, has impacted hundreds and thousands of kids for Jesus, and he's still doing that to this day. I mean, incredible. Thing. But if, if he could get there without all that stuff at the beginning, then was any of that of value for me? Was any of that of value for me? It seems like a good question. And Paul is going to answer that. But before he does, he's going to let the question go a little deeper. Because the second part of this passage in verses 5 to 8 is, is a question he's going to raise that spans the ages. This is a huge question that we're going to get into right here before he starts answering stuff. Now, in this part, we, we know that this book that we call Romans was the one letter that Paul wrote to people he had not yet visited. Paul has not yet been to Rome. So he is writing this to folks that he's not worshipped with to this point. All the other letters that he writes are written to cities, to churches, or to young pastors that he knows, that he's met, that he's spent time with. That, that's why when we study those letters, understanding the context, understanding their setting, understanding who they are is so important because Paul and these people knew each other. And so as he writes, sometimes he's assuming they remember things they've already said or, you know, he understands their culture. But the Romans, this is different. Paul has not been there yet. He's going to eventually go there, but the letter gets there first. And that matters here because Paul knows the arguments, as we said, that the gospel has stirred up everywhere he goes. And that these same arguments are likely to get stirred up when they read this letter. So in verses 5 to 8, he speaks of another argument 
that they're probably going to hear. If our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, then how is it fair that God would judge us? I mean, if, here, here's, this sounds a little silly, but if me being a sinner helps God look more righteous, then maybe I should be a really big sinner. You know? I mean, that, that, that sounds odd, but, it, it, but it's actually deeper than that. Follow me here. If God gave us the law, gave us Jews the law, but none of us can live up to it, then what was its purpose? See, Paul's going to try to convince them and us that the reason for the law was to reveal our sin and to help us know we need grace. And, you know, I could think about, you know, being that church kid, the fact that I was trying every day to live good, but honestly knowing there were days I dropped the ball. Anybody else drop the ball? Anybody else uh, not quite live up to what you hoped for? Even Paul said he, in Romans 7, he struggled with that. So what was the point? It was to help me realize I can't do this. I can't meet the standard. I need grace. For Jews, the law made their need of grace evident, something Gentiles were learning very quickly. So it's not just why bother trying in verses 1 through 4. Now it's, well, why not sin even more? And Paul's going to go after that one as he starts chapter 6. He's going to start that chapter with, like he's screaming. He's going to say, God forbid, God forbid. It's a mindset that mis misunderstands the impact of sin. And I want to explain it here just a little bit. Because God loves us by calling us away from sin. Let me say that again because a few of you, only about five of you, believe me. But God... God loves us when he calls us from sin, when he establishes a command or a directive to steer us from something. He does so out of love. Let, follow me here. The commands in Scripture, whether we're talking about the law of the Old Testament or we're talking about the directives from Jesus given to us in the New Testament, they call us away from sin for two primary reasons. Number one, yes, sin separates us from God. And sin keeps us from the opportunity to have the kind of relationship with God that he wants us to have. But secondly, sin also keeps us from the life God wants us to have. I'm amazed at how many Christian folks I have encountered that, that don't realize this. The life that he created us to engage and to enjoy. You see, some people see God's commands as standing between them and the fun they want to have. You ever felt that or ever, ever run into anybody? The person next to you has probably thought that. I mean, a lot of us church kids, we thought that at certain points, didn't we? You know, I can't do this, I can't do that because God says, and boy, I'm bummed out. All this righteous stuff is just spoiling my fun. But that attitude clearly ignores what God has shown us. That the very best life is found in obedience to God. Why? Well, he's the creator of life. Wouldn't it make sense that he knows the best way to live it? By his commands, he shows us that while sin might look good in the moment, might have an appeal initially, it ends badly. It takes us down roads we would never want. I mean, for example, lying might get you out of trouble in the instant, but how many know it'll probably get you in deeper trouble the further you go, and if you make that a pattern in your life, what happens? You end up being a person no one trusts, and others are reluctant to get close to. You don't get a good life when you commit that sin. We could talk about adultery. Might, might seem pleasurable in the moment, might be something that appeals to you in the moment, but you're very possibly going to destroy the most treasured relationships in your life. You see, God knows that sin that looks so appealing in the instant takes us down roads we don't want and gives us a life we would never choose. And so when God gives us commands, it, it's, not, it's not somehow out of a desire to control us. Instead, it's, it's out of his love for us. That's why the idea of sin more because of grace, no, why would you do that? Why would you continue to sow those unhealthy seeds in your life? At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, after Moses has just laid out the entirety of the law, all 600 plus commands of the Old Testament law. Hope you've memorized those. <laughs> we get to the end of the book of Deuteronomy and the first half of chapter 28 in Deuteronomy, Moses is describing for people the good stuff they get through obedience. 
the way God will bless their lives as they are obedient to his commands of the law. The second half of the chapter offers the flip side. The second half of chapter 28 says that here's what you get if you don't obey. Here's, here's the results. And so lays it out very, very clearly. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I wanted to read you this verse this morning because this is so clear, at least to me, verse 19, Moses sums it up with the choice. It's kind of the altar call moment. He says, today I call heaven and earth as witnesses, witnesses against you or of your choice. I've set before you life and death blessings and cursings. Choose life. Choose life that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. How many know that God's got good stuff for you? God directs your life and, and he tries to help maybe fix a few things and, and adjust some habits because he loves you. He, he wants good things for you. He wants good things for you. Why does God call us away from sin? It's not really because he wants from us. He wants for us. And those of us who've experienced his grace, now we have the potential of a whole new life open before us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It's hard to confront all these questions without wanting to jump right into the answers that Paul's offering. But we're not quite there yet because the third part of this, the meat of this passage, comes in verse 9. In verses 9 through 20, where we, we get all these quotes from Psalms and, and, and one from Isaiah where Paul is taking a collection of verses and putting them all together. That's why in your copy of the Bible, if it's laid out this way, it looks like a poem in the middle or it's kind of set apart because he's quoting you know, as it's written kind of stuff. Verses 9 to 20 get us to the truth Paul is trying to convey. He started in chapter 1 talking about the wickedness of all mankind. He, in chapter 2, he starts talking about the Jews and their failures and all that. Now he's putting it all together. And he's going to present the truth that his Jewish friends are trying so hard to resist that there is none righteous, not one, not a Jew, not a Gentile, not even one. Now I can understand why that might be hard for them to swallow because that's probably hard for us too. I mean a life of effort to obey the law for them, I think it had kind of led them to believe that surely God grades on the curve because I've run into this not from Jews but from just ordinary folks today. You know what that is to grade on the curve? I'm a college professor so let me explain what grading on the curve is for just a moment here. When you grade on the curve, what you do is you change the standard of evaluation on a test. So rather than you take the test and how many did you get right and I grade you against the score key, well, if I grade you on the curve, I don't grade you against the score key, but instead I grade you against another student, the student who did the best in the class. It's called grading on the curve. It's, it, it can work out really well in your favor, really nice, especially if the top score was really bad. It suddenly makes you look better. You know, I mean, it's like, what well, you know, I got a, I only got 70% right, but the top grade was 90, so that, make, that gives me like an 80. I mean, I, I went from a C to a B just because this guy didn't do perfect. You know, it's, that's, that's the nature of grading on the curve. It, uh, don't try to figure that out. Ask your kids. They'll explain it to you. Um, but the curve no longer examines my effort against the standard. It examines my effort against the performance of others. See, the idea of a curve suggests that maybe the exam could be unfair. Maybe as a professor, I didn't do a good enough job covering some areas. But if this student got that right, then I could expect others to get it right as well. Well, when the Jews looked around and they saw the Gentiles and their ignorance of the law, well, it's just kind of easy to think that you're better. At least I'm not as bad as them. You ever thought that or run into that? You know, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, when I look at everybody else, I'm a pretty good guy. Jesus told a really cool parable about this in Luke chapter 18. Let's just jump there real quick. In verse 9, he says, To some who were confident in their own righteousness. There we go. And they looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself. And pray, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. <laughs> thank you, Lord, I'm not like those bozos. 
That's the more modern translation. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this guy, this tax collector. Not sure why I pointed at Pastor Troy when I said that. But. <laughs> I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood, stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then Jesus explains the parable. He says, I tell you, it's that guy. Not, not the Pharisee, but that guy that went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Only one guy went home justified in Jesus' story. And it's the guy who understood what Paul's trying to say here. The guy who realized his need of a Savior. Frankly, this is the line that the gospel draws in the sand. In fact, we cannot experience the glorious stuff coming in the rest of the book of Romans until we face this. This is fundamental. In our, in our day, we prize tolerance rather than truth, don't we? We speak of religious ideas as though they're ours to choose, like, like preferences. Hey, believe what you want to believe, whatever works for you, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever fits your life, like consumers scan, scanning store shelves, looking for what will look good on us or fit us best, sharing our beliefs sometimes like sales clerks, explaining the benefits of a product that we've come to admire. But Paul knows that the gospel has to start right here with a clear, unvarnished acknowledgement of our need. There is none righteous, not a Jew, not a Gentile, not me, not them, not you. Paul says to his Jewish audience, you should know this best. Because the law showed you this. The law showed you what sin is. You should know this best. No one can be justified by a law they're unable to keep. You see, when righteousness is measured, it's God who's the standard. It's God who's the standard. There's no curve to suggest my failure is not as bad as somebody else. I can be tempted to look down my nose at other people. The choices they might make that maybe I stay clear of, I can make myself feel better than some, maybe even most, and use my religion to draw lines between me and others. But the only real line in the sand is the one between me and God. And nobody else's sin lightens the darkness of that line. When I was a kid, we used to say that uh, some preacher stepped on our toes. <laughs> Anybody remember that? When they touched on something that we were guilty of, some of you know what I'm talking about there. Well, Paul doesn't just step on our toes there. He tramples on every foot on the planet. That's why I wore this today. No, I'm not kidding. That's not it. Because he knows the only way I will find a Savior is to first admit that I need one. And then he closes this section, verses 21 and 22, with hope. Somehow, there's hope for you and me and for any who will heed Paul's words. This entire letter is an explanation of that hope. It's the most beautiful of all Paul's letters as it weaves the gospel so clearly. And I'm really glad your pastors are walking you through this wonderful book because there is an answer. Paul doesn't leave us without hope in the midst of this painful admission. I mean, if, we were, if we're willing to acknowledge this, I'm so glad the letter doesn't stop here. In fact, quite frankly, I'm so grateful that the text today included these two verses because if you notice in your Bible, there's a section break after verse 20 in most of our, and if we'd have stopped there, this would be a lousy week. I mean, we would go home <laughs> discouraged and frustrated and hating ourselves and, and all of that, but thank you for giving us verse 21 and 22 because these last two verses mark the turning point in Paul's argument. Paul tells us of a path the law never presented. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. There's no difference in our need. There's no difference in the offer. There is a path to God's righteousness, and we didn't, and we can't find it on our own. The righteousness we can't possibly attain has been made available to Jews and Gentiles alike, and it's been made available to you and me as well. It's a righteousness given only through faith in Jesus. 
this incredible gift of grace, something as Paul is going to just continue to explain over the next several chapters. But it's a gift that can only be given when we acknowledge what we are not and then stand confident in what he truly is. A gift we could never deserve, yet got one that God took extraordinary steps to provide for us. My performance could never meet the standard of righteousness. The law showed us that. So what did God do? He didn't change the law. But he gave his son to fulfill every requirement. And then he offered his life in exchange for my own. So now every day I want to live in that righteousness. That may seem like an odd reaction, but not so that I'll be good enough. I mean, that ship sailed, right? right? No, every day I long for righteousness because I understand the price that he paid for me. Every day I long for righteousness because I long to be like him. Every day I long for righteousness in a way kind of like a daily thank you card because I understand the incredible gift he's provided. Every day I long for righteousness because I want to offer myself to him as a living sacrifice. Something in chapter 12 Paul's going to tell us is the most logical response to this gift. So we conclude today simply this way. Maybe you say, well, Mike, since there's such good news at the end, can we just skip all the bad news at the beginning? No, you can't. Because the truth about us is what helps you grasp the truth about him. The most painful admission opens the door to eternal life. That's the gospel. And that gospel is within your reach as well. But it's on the other side of an honest admission that I know I need him, that I'm not good enough that I will never be good enough. Pray with me, will you? Lord Jesus, I thank you for these friends today. God, because of my limitations, I can't see every face in the room. But you see every individual in this room. You desire the same thing for them that Paul desired for his friends that he wrote to. You want us to see that you indeed are our hope. When we recognize there's none righteous. We saw it in chapter 1. We saw even among the, the Jews who thought so highly of themselves in chapter 2 and it all comes together right here to acknowledge all of us need a Savior. All of us fail to meet the standard of your righteousness. And when we're ready to acknowledge that, then that answer just emerges so beautifully. You are our hope. God, I pray for these friends today as we just consider how to respond to this. It may be that someone is here today, God, there might be several, that this is maybe the first time they've understood the gospel or had it explained to them like this. There might be others in the room, God, that they've asked you to help them with their lives. They, they've wanted you to be a part of their lives, but they've really not ever had that realization or that acknowledgement of their, of their own sinfulness, that they need you as their Savior. They need you to cleanse them. They, even, even though they're glad to have added you to their journey, they have not realized that this is really about connecting them to your journey. Lord, wherever we find ourselves this morning, maybe, maybe we've known and walked with you for decades, and today we just need a moment to celebrate what we've been given. Wherever we find ourselves today, Lord, I pray that this foundational moment in Paul's letter to the Romans would be real in our hearts. That we could read verse 10, there's none righteous, and raise our hand and say, I know, me too. And yet we could rejoice in verse 22, that the righteousness we cannot produce has been provided for us by your love, by your sacrifice. That is the gospel. Friend, in this moment, however you feel to respond to, to the Bible today, to this truth. 
Maybe it's something you want to explore more. Maybe it's something you want to understand more deeply. I, I get that. I respect that. And you're in a place today filled with people that would love to help walk that journey with you. Maybe you're ready to make that acknowledgement. I know there's a place on the card that's there. Pastor Troy will maybe come explain that here in just a minute. But what I say to you, even though we've perhaps never met, and you may not trust me enough to receive it just from me, but what I'm saying to you today is you, like me, no matter your story, no matter how good you've been or not been, you need what Jesus has provided for you. You need God's grace, and he has got a wonderful life on the other side of that choice. And I want to encourage you this morning to consider the truth of God's word to your life. Pastor, would you come?